is today's webinar. I saw an earlier version of this presentation at CNI in December of last year, and I was really inspired because NYPL is addressing the challenging issues of dealing with their substantial audio and moving image collections in a very brave and direct way. I know from our surveys of special collections in the US and Canada and in the UK and Ireland that dealing with AV collections is a high level challenge for many institutions in the OCLC Research Library Partnership and beyond. So I'm very pleased to welcome Ann Thornton, Evelyn Frangelis, and Bill Stingone to share with us how they are moving NYPL's audio and moving image research collections into the future. And I'm gonna turn it over to Anne, right, and colleagues, and you now have presenter privileges. Please take it away. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so um, we're really excited to share with you what is very much a work in progress, um, and we'll be sharing with you not only um, what we've learned uh, and what we're still very much working on, but We'll also be sharing uh, with everyone who's attending today um, some practical steps that any organization can take to uh, start to address these issues on a local level, um, the kinds of issues that, that we're grappling here with uh, at, the, at the New York Public Library. Um, so uh, just to kick us off uh, quickly, um, I wanted to give a, a sense of um, what this project included. So first of all, the reason why we're doing it is because of our audio and moving image holdings, which we refer to as AMI uh, for short, are really incredibly important. Um, they include um, uh, rare, uh, unique documentation of performing arts events, uh, including some that we have documented ourselves, many that we have documented in dance and theater. Um, they include um, uh, original uh, documentation of events uh, that have happened in history. Um, and these collections are becoming increasingly important to uh, researchers as well. Right, so we want to stress from the beginning that in addition to our focus on preservation, we're of course doing this to, to make the material accessible. Um, and in addition to making it accessible, we think that having this material digitally will present other opportunities for us. Um, first of all, we believe it will make some of these materials easier to describe and catalog, um, but also provide potentially new avenues of access, um, particularly technologies such as automated audio transcription of, of, of digital recordings uh, the ability to browse videos and audio recordings and tagging tools for staff and for researchers uh, look appealing as we look at uh, into the digital future. And since our collections are used by um, not only researchers but also artists and performing artists and uh, entrepreneurs and a wide range of students at all levels, um, we we wanted to to get a, a better sense of, of the scale um, that we were talking about and some of the challenges um, that we were facing as, as an institution. Uh, so we were very fortunate to receive a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which funded a comprehensive preservation assessment. And um, under Evelyn Frangakis's leadership, um, we uh, uh, did this survey and uh, developed some recommendations and are now taking action to, um, to really uh, save the most essential material from our collections. So let me um, then go to the actual process and Evelyn will talk about that. So in looking at our collections and the scale of our collections, we started to look around the country and see who else might have comparable size and scope of challenge and where we might turn to for some advice and partnerships. So we looked at what other institutions were doing, including some very uh, large organizations like the Library of Congress, and visited the Library of Congress, the National Archives, also visited Indiana University, and Every one of us has our own unique challenges and distinct approaches to these challenges. We 
decided that while our collections are larger than Indiana's, that we felt aligned to their to their process. So we modeled our approach to Indiana's. They were very gracious partners. We visited for a period of time. They spoke with us, shared with us what they did, how it worked, and allowed us to beta test a tool that they developed called MediaScore, which I'll briefly discuss in a little bit. Part of the success of the Indiana approach we felt was the process and that they established. So they had an executive sponsorship within their organization at the associate provost level. They also had a working group that met very regularly. They developed a set of guiding principles and they had a really good approach to project management. So we modeled all of that activity in the same manner here at New York Public and and very graciously agreed to be our executive sponsor um, to be involved to the degree that she could be. And what was key in that process for us was that it also allowed Anne to bring back what was happening with this program to NYPL's executive team, keep them abreast of what was going on, and continue to help us raise the profile of these very important at-risk collection collections, rather. So on our working group, we had curatorial representation, IT representation, preservation representation, and general administrative representation. This group, no matter what, met on a weekly basis. Sometimes we went through really very sort of heavy technological issues. Other times we just met um, to brief each other on what was happening. but. It was really important to set aside dedicated time and have individuals who were very committed to serving on this working group and move it through the process. The guiding principles that I have referenced are available on our website, so I, I won't go into that activity. What was also really important to our process is how broadly we involved people throughout New York Public Library. So we involved all of the curatorial areas that have AMI collections and every other part of the library that might have some relationship or impact upon the care of these collections and the access of these collections were involved. I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So we had uh, we, we had some conversations internally about what would realistically be a deep dive time frame into our collections to know the many, many things we needed to know. And those frank conversations within the organization and with our contract partner, AV Preserve, indicated that it really was an 18-month long effort. We made a very conscious decision that we wanted to accelerate that process. We were willing to invest, invest the extra resources required to make it into a 12-month process. So we're very cognizant of the fact that we are in a race against time, that we're looking at a 10 to 15 year window of being able to save these materials. And we really just wanted to get on with it, um, with this enormous challenge and be able to get the data that we needed and begin planning and then moving forward. So Mellon funded three phases and our partner AV Preserve undertook this project in these three phases that you see on the screen. So in the first phase, just very quickly, we, they surveyed the curatorial staff who have AMI collections. They looked at all of the various formats in those collections, and they looked at all of the spaces that house these collections, both in our research libraries, in other spaces in New York City, outside of New York City, and outside of the state. So essentially, they touched almost every object in the collections. The, the data, the result of that was that we have baseline information about those collections and sort of our current state. And we now have a format level inventory of all of our um, AMI materials. 
From there, we moved on to phase two, which was really taking the massive quantity of data that we were amassed and in looking at all of the materials and where it was stored and located in their conditions and their state of processing or not, and developed recommendations around all of those findings. So the first two phases were really core around collection activity and collection state. The third phase was something that we were wanted to look into in terms of future of internal capacity. So we asked AV Preserve to look at our facilities, look at the equipment in our AMI labs, look at the workflows we've established, and tell us from their perspective what it would take to ramp up if we decided to increase internal lab capacity. What would it take to move that forward? So at this stage, with the positions that we will talk about a little later that we have posted, we will be at maximum lab capacity. Our studios have no more room for expansion. Okay, so lots of data was uh, produced as a result of this effort. And Anne is uh, chuckling here next to me because she, along with the rest of the AMI working group, went through what we uh, say, you know, maybe 15 or so spreadsheets. We feel like there were more spreadsheets with this very detailed data. So we amassed an enormous amount of data. And what I, we wanted to show you here is just a sampling of some of the data that was collected. And this particular slide about media score highlights a tool that was developed by Indiana to, to do to prioritize. Now, for us, what we did with it was use the data behind the tool um, to serve as the base score for the rankings that we chose. So we use this to assess the prioritization of all of the items in our holdings. And we looked at this as a key performance indicator to multiply, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, to give um, weighted hours of what we were doing in terms of transferring of specific types of formats. We wanted to be able to see what the labs do and what they can do. The, I think we can go on to the next slide because what I'm going to say relates to the next slide. Our lab staff, a very highly skilled in their own specific areas also are relied upon by the library. They're pulled away to do many other things that support the mission of the library that serve library goals, but that are not necessarily production oriented. So for example, they served the key leads in our AMI lab, served on this working group and uh, helped with this assessment. And they also give tours and classes to graduate students and participate in many activities, including if we have interns that are passing through the labs and things like that. So we really wanted as another key performance indicator to really look at what the nature of their contributions were beyond just the production. So production as it stands now in terms of statistics we had been gathering is not reflective entirely of their many contributions. So we, <clears throat> excuse me. So we looked at labor hours because different formats require different levels of investment in reformatting and if we, only looked at production and throughput, the, there is a sort of skewed sense of incentives, right? The incentives would be to work on the formats which take the least amount of time to digitize. That's not necessarily indicative of the most at risk or most important material. So we looking only at um, what the number of hours of 
how we had collected this data before was really giving us an artificial sense of well-being and a skewed um, incentive. So we're looking at labor hours in the way of weighting the factors of what it would take to um, look more appropriately at that investment. So what you see on this slide are the types of formats that are done uh, that are reformatted in our studios and the labor that was done in 2013 numbers is what you're looking at here. We're used to generate audiovisual preservation unit or AVPU minutes that you see. And this is creating an equitable approach that weighs the resulting unit to place incentives in the correct place. All right, I think we're going to go to life cycle costs. So this was an interesting, um, again, we're just giving you a representation of the kinds of data that we collected. This, this was an interesting part of a conversation of one of our work, weekly working group meetings, and we met uh, bi-weekly with AV Preserve as they were doing their own work in parallel with the working group itself. We had a curator who asked at one of these meetings, um, what are the financial implications of accepting a donation of a single recording? And had a conversation about that, about it's an important factor when deciding whether or not to accept something that is being donated, and it's an important factor to know when we are purchasing materials as well. And how could we know this so that we could have better informed conversations with our donors and set up a better partnerships for taking this material in and caring for it in the long run. So AV Preserve tried to create a calculator to estimate the cost of what it takes to preserve single units for their ongoing life. And that's what you see here in this representation. I, uh, then we have a link on the next slide for cost of inaction calculator. And I just wanted to talk about that very briefly because uh, the part, some of this was a tool that was being developed by AV Preserve and it really was at the core of a number of our conversations within the AMI working group, which is to look at what would happen if we let these materials escape our attention, if we let them go away. So cost of an action tool, which you have the link there on the presentation, it's a model that's aimed at helping institutions make better decisions or well-informed decisions about digitizing their legacy collections and to understand what the implications are of the decisions that they make and the options that they have. So. Prior to this tool being developed, there really was no consistent way for institutions to quantify the financial and intellectual or cultural cost of inaction to support the arguments that preservation and curatorial staff have been making for years about what the needs are. So it's to bridge the conversation gap between those who care for the collections and those who control the budget. So the cost of inaction addresses the, this issue and offers a platform to enable this productive discussion and decision making. So I wanted to point this out, that this tool was being developed while our assessment was happening, but separately from it, and it is a, a very useful tool. I recommend it for those of you who might be interested in these kinds of in conversations within your own institution. All right, so quickly, the findings of our survey was that we have over 800,000 AMI items in nine, primarily in nine curatorial units across three of our four research libraries. The number was pretty consistent with what we thought we were going to find, so that we were happy about that. We found that we had 60 different types of formats in four asset types from unique material to commercial material to, um, to derivatives. We found that approximately one third of the collection was at highest priority. And those, that one third represented materials that are unique. 
or otherwise rare or critical to the mission of that particular curatorial unit. All right. The recommendations that came out of the report, uh, I will say that we, in addition to the 15 or so spreadsheets that we have, we have about 230 or 40 pages of uh, written reports documenting the findings, the state of things, and, and quite a broad array of recommendations. So just very quickly to say that we were looking in our findings for this 15-year window of opportunity, and for budget scenarios, let's say, or action scenarios were developed. One was the status quo, the current state, things that are, and we have shared some pretty stark numbers with that, that at current state it would take us about 40 years to reformat, or 40 to 44 years to reformat our video collections. Of course, we don't have that time. It would take us at current capacity about 1,100 years to get through our audio collections. That's really representative of the investments that we have a much bigger audio collection and less audio staff. And it would take 2,000 years to process it all. So those were pretty staggering numbers for us, and that, that's sort of our status quo. Then we looked at a scenario that would give us increased outsourcing by keeping essentially the same internal capacity that we have, and we came up with what the loss figures would be for that as well as a budget figure for moving forward with that. We looked at a fixed budget, for example. We looked at where we would get if we threw $5 million a year at it, and where we would be, which I'm sorry to say is not without loss to that top one third. And then we looked at a scenario that was no loss. That was a staggering figure for New York Public because that came in at a cost of $121 million. However, those scenarios did include a, the range of costs that needed to be considered. So they're not just reformatting, they're reformatting, they're processing cataloging costs, their physical storage costs, and their digital storage costs. So they were all inclusive. The report also made recommendations for policy changes in how we manage our materials coming in, how we acquire them, how we move them through our system, and how we care for them over their entire life cycle. And I, Bill's going to, I think, talk a little bit more about that. Right. Um, so, in addressing these recommendations, um, we've already begun making a few organizational changes and steps. Um, in recently, just in the last few weeks, we, we brought together um, our preservation division and the two units that were doing special collection processing um, into form one unit we're calling special collections. Uh, we're hoping that, in addition to other things, it will allow us to address these AMI issues at an un unprecedented scale and also in a singular way throughout the library. Um, we've begun to recruit for several new positions, all of which, I think most of which, I should say, uh, represent reallocations of existing resources. So we're, as I think Evelyn mentioned, we're, we're currently recruiting for a head of audio and moving image preservation. We're going to be recruiting soon our first head of digital preservation at the library. We've added an audio engineer, and uh, we're hiring two uh, AMI archivists and reassigning two other processing staff to, and all four of which will be devoted to what we're calling, or just started to call, our, a rapid inventory uh, project of AMI, uncontrolled AMI holdings. Um, and just briefly, what that project entails is to sort of to uh, address all of the uh, uh, uncontrolled or semi-controlled AMI um, throughout the library, do sort of high-level appraisal, such as deduping and weeding out of commercial recordings, uh, doing high-level collection descriptions when possible, but also rehousing re and barcoding all the materials and recording things like what's on the label, what the formats are, and any other uh, any, any other data that might help us prioritize the, the, the um, reformatting of that material. 
Um, we're also looking to where we store the material after we do this inventory. Right now, most of the facilities in which we store AMI are suboptimal at best. Uh, we're planning to move the material that we inventory to our off-site storage facility, which has the best environment the library has. And yes, uh, we're reassessing every step in our AMI processes. Um, we're looking to reduce the per unit costs that you saw in an earlier slide, which um, I, I personally refuse to accept. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're confident that we could, we could reduce those per unit costs, um, and obviously the, the, the the issue still remains uh, daunting, but perhaps as we get more into particulars, it will become less so. Um, did you want to talk about the funding? Are we also looking at more broadly uh, ways we could raise money um, and reall reallocate even more existing budgets to focus on the high priority AMI initiative um, and looking for creative ways uh, of doing outsourcing um, and increasing lab capacity, but perhaps. So just as a historical perspective, in the past, the reformatting of these collections was really curatorially driven, and the way in which we funded those also tended to be either curatorially driven or through preservation or through other sort of seized opportunities, but they weren't systematic necessarily. They were somewhat ad hoc, and what we're looking at now is focusing much more strategically about how we approach this effort and doing it in a more efficient scale, a more efficient way at a faster and higher scale. So while we still are using all of those internal resources um, to work to our advantage until we develop a fully funded strategy, we are still doing some outsourcing projects, and they tend to be in the $75,000 to $200,000 category of distinct projects, the outsourcing projects. We are looking at, since we are now maxed out or soon to be maxed out in our staffing capacity in the labs, we are continue to invest in equipment as I'm sure those of you on this webinar know equipment becomes an ongoing challenge for us to be able to procure functional obsolete equipment and keep it running for as long as we need to have it running. We've been discussing a very focused fundraising strategy. So the grants in place that I've already um, referred to, the $75,000 to $200,000 range are in that bullet that say MERS and Wilson. I'm, um, MERS is our moving image and recorded sound collection at the Schomburg Center. We have a large grant to work on some of their materials right now. We also have a broader grant over the course of five years that will give us close to a half a million dollar yearly investment in AMI moving forward. We are certainly looking at future grants in a variety of Avenues. How's that? <laughs> so for partnerships, some of what we looked at in the report, of course, is how to do this in a very, move forward in a very strategic way to be able to work at the capacity needed in the next 10 to 15 years without putting in structures that would become obsolete in the future or unnecessary to us beyond that time frame? And how could we accelerate our process through strategic partnerships? So for example, we've talked about looking at our own strengths and what we might bring to the table. If we were to partner with other organizations, what would we bring to it and what do we need from others? So we are still investigating that or those thoughts. We are looking at large scale, long term vendor relationships and what that might yield us in terms of benefit. Um, we have I don't, we're not ready actually to divulge any of those, but we have started talking about public-private partnerships and what we can gain from those. For example, if we are to focus on our most distinctive collections, is there, do our other collections provide value to others 
where we can partner to make more of our collections accessible for the long term. All right. Um, so one of the things that, that we want to do um, is to make sure that we're sharing our work with others. Um, and we have a summary report uh, from the Mellon Foundation funded grant um, project to assess the collections. But we're going to continue to share uh, our progress on this work in progress um, as we go. And you know we're going to continue to to speak about it and write about it when, when we have opportunities to do that. Um, so we're providing you with some, with some links here. But um, we also want to make sure that um, we talk a little bit today about some steps that any organization can take, um, even if you don't have a grant from the Mellon Foundation, um, even if you don't have any internal capacity for addressing this today. There are some practical steps that individual institutions can take, regardless of your size, regardless of the size of your collection, and regardless of the level of investment you are making today uh, to deal with audio and moving image collections. So I'll let Bill and Evelyn talk a little bit about that. Uh, the first thing that I think is obvious um, is no matter how large your institution is, uh, is to come together every single even if there's only two units that have, might have a several cassettes in, in your library, um, if those two people can get in a room and start talking about what to do about it institutionally as opposed to what they're trying to do in their, in their own little shops, that, that, that is a big step forward. It took us, it took us several decades to, to make that enormous leap, but, but it's been uh, it's paying off so far. We, we've um, talked about, in a, to follow up what Bill said, looking at the tools that are out there and available to you already to and bringing in expertise that might be valuable to you, whether it is an organization, an, an external contractor like we use, who can certainly do this work on a smaller scale, or other institutional or professional experts that can come in and help you understand what it is that you have so that you know what you're dealing with and what your options are for moving forward. We'd also talked uh, uh, amongst our group here at New York Public about the importance of focusing on preservation as a long-term payoff, that that will yield institutions the ability to do many things in the future, including the obvious, which is continue to make this material accessible uh, as far into the future as it might be needed. Right, and I think that the focus on preservation, while it sounds rather obvious and no-brainer, I mean, there are a lot of things that we were doing in our processes that were slowing down um, our ability to address this problem at scale. Um, you know, the, the, Evelyn already described the way that we um, we're very um, curatorial unit focused and on discrete small projects, um, but also um, the way that we were uh, processing material, cataloging material was um, not the most efficient way to get uh, things done quickly. Um, and you know, since we are in a race against time, it's really important to keep that focus on saving as much material as we possibly can and making it clear that that's the goal. Um, we all want these collections to be accessible, and that means they need to be discoverable as well, and of course cataloging is incredibly important. Um, we also must ensure that they continue to exist in the future. Um, and so keeping the focus on that um, so that we could you know, really ramp up our effort was, was really critical. And to state that really obvious, um, make sure your accessioning procedures account for AMI material, um, and that doesn't mean putting it over to the side <laughs> until someone comes along and knows what to do about it. One of the things that we didn't discuss um, that you just reminded me, Bill, is the curatorial review form that is here at New York Public very thorough. 
in asking about the nature of the collections we're taking in, including their state and whether or not they come with funds to make them accessible or to process them, to preserve them. And it is something that we do on a broad scale here at New York Public, not just for AMI collections, but that the Preservation Division is always available to the curatorial units to help them understand what they're taking in, not to dissuade them from necessarily taking something in, but to inform them about what we are looking at once this material comes in the, into the collection. It's a very powerful planning tool. Yes. That's right. So I think, um, you know, we, we want to emphasize um, bef right before we go to, into questions um, that, you know, from our perspective, the most important thing that we could do, knowing that we had um, this really big challenge at the library, was to really try to face it head on and to not be overwhelmed by the scale of it. And of course, scale is relative, so whether it's, you know, 1,500 objects that you have that are, you know, you don't know what to do with, or it's 800,000 things you don't know what to do with, um, to not be overwhelmed by that and to figure out some way to address it head on and not just let it sit to the side and fester. Um, because you won't, you, you, you won't have it anymore if you do that. Um, uh, so we have a, a link here that you can uh, explore later on your own. Um, this is from Preservation Week last year. Um, one of our incredible um, engineers in the lab, our audio engineer, Danny Spardella, uh, put together this incredible um, uh, uh, video and, and audio um, of uh, Bizet's uh, Habanera from Carmen, um, and I, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful way to see the range of formats uh, just an audio that we're dealing with, um, and it's it's a beautiful way to describe uh, the stewardship role that libraries have, um, and the responsibility that we have to keep making sure this stuff is accessible into the future. And for those of you that are willing to take the few minutes to watch it, just to let you know, the format that you are seeing on the screen as it's playing is what you are actually listening to. You're listening to the to the reformatting of that particular medium. So we're, Anne and I are very impressed with it because it, it flows so seamlessly. So. You, you barely <laughs> notice when you change from one decade to another and um, one format to another because it's so expertly sliced together. But it's fun. And I'll make one other last plug, which is that National Preservation Week is next week and New York Public has a wide variety of sessions that are going to be offered both on site and you ought to be able to plug in from our website for other things as well. Great. All right. So well, I think thank for, you. For, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Take it over. I, I think we're ready for, for questions and I will um while I'm waiting for people to type uh questions into the into the chat box, I will attest that this is uh quite a remarkable video. I enjoyed it very much and when I send out the link for the with the recording with um some other links that have been shared uh in, in chat here um, uh, I'll, I'll also include um, a link so that you to this recording so that you don't have to scramble around and try to um, try to uh, uh, copy it. So um, we have a couple of people who typed some things into um, the chat box. Uh, first of all, my colleague Ricky Irway comments that the life cycle cost calculation is brilliant. Um, it's important to be aware of what we're taking on at a time that we're considering adding it to the collections, and I couldn't agree more more with that with that sentiment. Um, Sean Quimby from Columbia uh, uh, notes that WGBH in Boston has invested heavily in user-driven digitization via its Open Vault program, and uh, shares a link. Um, I don't know if you guys have any comments about the the Open Vault. Uh, program. Um, Not specifically about that program, Marilee, but I can tell you that when we were discussing strategic partnerships and how we might move forward in a, an assortment of ways, we have talked about the issue of microfunding, um, these efforts, and also just looking at how else the public might be able to help us. Um, in terms of just a patron investment. Right. 
Would you like to, anyone else like to comment on that? Um, from a public service point of view, we, we have engaged in sort of digitization on demand. Um, in fact, it's one of the things that we're looking at right. in terms of how, what impact that has on our overall capacity. Um, so it's sort of a strange conundrum because we're doing this to provide access. How, on the other hand, the, it, it doesn't allow us to operate at a certain scale, and it, it makes scheduling things somewhat difficult within the lab. So, um, right. Anyway, yeah. If anyone had any solutions to that problem, I'm <laughs> happy to hear them. Yeah. Um, another uh, one of our um, uh, attendees, Angela Soward from the Welcome in London. Thank you for staying up with us. Uh, notes really interesting webinar. Your life cycle costs are consistent with what I've experienced. I think the BFI mentioned something like a um, thousand uh, pounds per film title. You mentioned four. So um, then here's a question from Jen Wolf. Did your strategy involve scaling back on non-AMI reformatting? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, we're so one of the things that I actually neglected to, to mention in terms of the context for this whole project um, was that last year, when as we were completing the assessment, the New York Public Library was also in the middle of a strategic planning process. And so, you know, thanks to the Mellon Foundation and this assessment uh, work that got done with the incredible leadership of our staff. We were really poised to raise the profile of this particular problem during that strategic planning effort. Um, we, you know, we also reformat, digitize materials that are um, not audio and moving image. We have a digital reformatting lab, a digital imaging unit, and we're uh, we're ramping up digitization efforts there as well and also looking at what we can outsource most effectively. That was a big part of our strategic plan. These two issues, though, were, are different, and they were addressed differently in our strategic plan. The AMI issue is really about saving this material, ensuring that it's available far into the future, not just within the next few years. Um, and with the other kind of reformatting, where it mostly works on paper, which are going to exist many, many years from now, we have time. The focus on ramping up there is about, um, you know, being able to reach broader audiences with those collections. It's about being able to support educational objectives, learning objectives for the library. It's very much about the. Um, uh, uh, access and, and creative uh, missions of the library and and, um, and of course the audio moving image collections are as well that's why we collected them in the first place but the the real goal and issue uh, here is with saving the material so both are important but for you know in terms of our planning processes for for different reasons and and I, I beg your pardon, I didn't see, I was looking, my chat window is in a little tiny window and I've now expanded it and I see the rest of Angela's statement, which was, oh, okay. you mentioned four asset types, unique, commercial, and derivative. What is the other one? Oh, uh, we don't quite remember. We're, we're looking for that. <laughs> there were four asset types. We'll, we'll, find, we'll find it. <laughs> we'll find it and respond. <laughs> okay, Angela, stay tuned. We'll uh, we'll, we'll find that question. out. Um, she also uh, comments, your, your comment on accessioning procedures taking into account AMI, don't put it aside, agree wholeheartedly. A um, couple more questions. Is your curatorial review at the item level? No. 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 <laughs> um. You would never get anything done if it were at the item level. Yeah. But, but which is to say uh, we, we strive for item counts. Um, at least rough ones, so yeah. So we know it's 50 videos as opposed to, say, 500. Um, but no. Uh, but we're we're working on how we might dig a little deeper into pre-acquisition evaluation as well. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that segues into uh, nicely into Jackie Dooley asks, will newer, newly acquired AMI materials receive a priority score, priority score at the time of accessioning? Yeah, and it, it should be very high. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, Are we collecting that'll be the, the question when we're collecting it. So uh, it's an interesting thing. One of the things that we want to, at least for me, um, as, as we think about collecting special collections and this AMI issue is we don't want to necessarily have this enormous work we need to do retrospectively completely determine what we collect going forward. Obviously, there's a balance in real, realism here, but um, to sort of, as we're looking at a new collection, trying to see what the costs are, but somehow somehow not piling that cost onto the cost of the, of the you know, uh, 50 years worth of work we need to do. Um, it obviously, you know, we only have so much capacity, but it's, it's one of the things we've had some pretty open and honest conversations about around here, and, and I think we'll have some more, which is that, you know, well, if you look at this, the question is why would we bring in any more at all? But I think the answer is that because we have to, because it's, it's what we do. Uh, it's just a matter of how and how much and, and, or, and, and, and how high a priority it is. I mean, if it's of marginal priority, well, then that, we're going to look at that much differently nowadays than we would have even, you know, three years ago. Here's a question from Molly Wheeler. In your workflow, are you providing further cataloging or description post-digitization? Uh, yes, I mean, we actually have a, a, a pretty robust team of, of AMI catalogers, um, and we have, uh, within our archival processing workflow, have ways of describing AMI. Uh, but it's one of the things we're looking at, which is the I mean, if all goes well, we'll have more AMI to catalog than we've ever had before and sort of looking at efficiencies there as well. I mean, those were one of the, that was the per item cost, one of the aspects of it that seemed quite high to me was the, the cataloging costs. And so we're looking at how we might streamline that both to accelerate access, but also just to reduce the cost of, of, to the institution so we can move through hundreds of thousands of items. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to not get into that yet because we realize the first thing we need to do is figure out what our preservation priorities are and get moving on that. But that's, that's coming soon. Okay. Um, I see only right now one final question which uh, segues into my concluding remarks, which is will we be sending slides to participants? We can share these slides. We'll also be sharing um, a, a recording uh, along with uh, numerous links, uh, some of my colleagues from OCLC Research um, were, uh, and elsewhere, were, were, were busy uh, uh, pasting in links to the um, summary report for the Mellon-funded uh, project, the cost of an action calculator, um, et cetera. So when I send out uh, the link to the recording, I'll also send out um, the, the links for your, for your handy enjoyment. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions. We do have a, an answer, I think, to the question that, that Angela yeah. asked about oh. the four asset types um, yeah. after, after reviewing the SICK report here. So, oh, okay. Um, we're not really sure why we always have a, um, a stumbling block on this. And of course, when it comes to our turn, it's like, <laughs> just, you know, of course. So we have the um, archival formats, which are the original formats. We have the preservation masters. We have um, the derivatives, the mezzanine files, and access files, which would be what we deliver. Mm -hmm. Although the four types were um, commercial, uh, um, oh gosh, where were they? We do. We have commercial recordings as well. You need commercial and, so and derivative. What what we can't ever remember are whether the um, we include derivatives as the as part of those assets. Right. But right. Right. In any case, a, a question for the ages. Well, in any case, I want to thank uh, you, our presenters, very much, and also thank um, the audience for being uh, so attentive and asking so many good questions. We'll be sharing the recording. Uh, I thank you very much, and this concludes today's webinar.
Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.